The wake-up call was finding this startling statistic that web usage in the spring of 1994 was growing at 2,300 percent a year. You know, things just don't grow that fast. It's highly unusual. And uh, that set me about thinking what, you know, what kind of business plan might make sense in the context of that growth. I think there are a couple of things. Um, and one of the things that everybody should realize, and that is probably the single most important factor, is that any startup company that turns into a substantial company over the years never lose track of the fact that there was a lot of luck involved in that. So, you know, there are a lot of entrepreneurs, there are a lot of people who are very smart, very hardworking, very few ever have, you know, the planetary alignment <laughs> <laughs> that leads to a tiny little company growing into something substantial. Um, so that requires not only a lot of planning, a lot of hard work, a big team of people who are all dedicated, but it also requires that not only the planets align, but that you know you get a few galaxies in there aligning too. And uh, that's certainly what happened to us. You know, our timing was good. Our uh, our choice of product categories, uh, books was a very good choice, and we did a lot of analysis on that to uh, to pick that category as the first best category. Uh, for e-commerce online, but there were no guarantees that that was a good category. Um, at the time we launched this business, it wasn't even crystal clear that the technology would improve fast enough that ordinary uh, people, you know, non-computer people, would even want to bother with this technology. So that was good luck. Um, so there are a whole bunch of things that have to sort of align to make it work. I um, went to my boss and said to him, you know, I'm going to go do this crazy thing and I'm going to start this, uh, this company selling books online. And this is something that I had already been talking to him about uh, in a sort of more general context. But then he said, let's go on a walk. And we went on a two-hour walk in Central Park in New York City. And the conclusion of that was this, he said, you know, this actually sounds like a really good idea to me but it sounds like it would be a better idea for somebody who didn't already have a good job. <laughs> uh, and he convinced me to think about it for 48 hours before making a final decision. And so I went away and, and, and was trying to find the right framework in which to make that kind of big decision. And you know, I'd already talked to my wife about this and she was very supportive and said, look, you, know, uh, you can count me in 100% um, whatever you want to do, you know, it's true. She had married this kind of, you know, fairly stable guy in a stable career path, and now he wanted to go do this crazy thing, but she was 100% supportive. So it really was a decision that I had to make for myself. And the, and the framework I found, which made the decision incredibly easy, was a, what, what I called, which only a nerd would call, a regret minimization framework. So I wanted to project myself forward to age 80 and say, okay, now I'm looking back on my life. I want to have minimized the number of regrets I have. And you know, uh, I knew that when I was 80, I was not going to regret having tried this. I was not going to regret having wanted, you know, trying to participate in this thing called the internet that I thought was going to be a really big deal. I knew that if I failed, I wouldn't regret that. But I knew the one thing I might regret is not ever having tried. And I knew that that would haunt me every day. Um, and so when I thought about it that way, it was an incredibly easy decision. Um, and I think that's a very good, it's, it's, if you can project yourself out to age 80 and sort of think, what will I think at that time? It gets you away from some of the daily pieces of confusion. You know, I left uh, this Wall Street firm in the middle of the year. When you do that, you walk away from your annual bonus. And that's the kind of thing then the short term can confuse you. But if you think about the long term, uh, then you can really make good life decisions that you won't regret later. Most regrets, by the way, are acts of uh, omission and not commission.
you know, I think most people when they're 80 years old, you know, you can do bad things. You can go murder somebody, and that would be bad, and that would be an act of commission that you would regret. But most, you know, everyday, ordinary, non-murderers, <laughs> their big regrets are omissions. Well, you know, th uh, it, that blank sheet of paper stage is one of the hardest stages. And one of the reasons it's hard is because there's, at that stage, there's nobody counting on you but yourself. You know, one of the things that is very motivating, I mean, today it's easy because we've got, you know, millions of customers counting on us and, uh, you know, thousands of investors counting on us and then thousands of employees all counting on each other. But in that beginning stage, it's really just you. And you can quit any time. Nobody's going to care. <laughs> uh, and so you set about doing the simple things first. So you want to start a company. Well, the first thing you do is you should write a business plan. And so I did that. I wrote about a 30-page business plan. I wrote a first draft. In fact, I wrote the first draft on the car trip uh, from, you know, from, from the East Coast to the West Coast. And that was, uh, th that is very helpful. Now, the business plan won't survive its first encounters with reality. Um, it will always be different. The, the reality will never be the plan. But the, the discipline of writing the plan forces you to think through some of the issues and to get sort of mentally comfortable in the space. I mean, then you sort of, you start to understand, you know, if you push on this knob, this will move over here and so on. And so that's the first step. Um, I tried to get a lot of the little housekeeping details done even before we arrived in Seattle. I called an attorney, actually. I called a friend who lived in Seattle, asked if he recommend an attorney. He said, yes, he recommended his divorce lawyer. <laughs> but that's who we used. It was a general practitioner and a small guy, you know, a sort of small uh, sole practitioner. He incorporated the company. He asked me on the cell phone, um, what uh, name would you like the company incorporated under? I said, Cadabra, uh, as in Abracadabra. And he said, Cadaver? Uh, and I knew then that was not going to be a good name. Um, <laughs> so we went ahead and incorporated it under that name. We changed it about three months later. Um, I stopped in uh, San Francisco and, uh, the, in, in, and interviewed uh, vice presidents of engineering because that was going to be an important long lead time item. We needed to build the technology that would run the store uh, and found uh, you know, the person who turned out to be the most important person ever in the history of Amazon.com on that trip, a guy named Shell Kappen, who uh, you know, built all of our early systems uh, with, with help from others, but he really sort of architected them and engineered them and just did a fantastic job. So that, you know, th th so the initial hiring, right the, writing the business plan, the initial hiring, getting the company incorporated, uh, 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 all these are, you know, they're very, in a way, they're sort of, you know, simple, almost pedestrian tasks, but that's how you start, one step at a time. The first uh, sort of initial startup capital for Amazon.com came primarily from my parents, and they invested a large fraction of their life savings uh, in what became Amazon.com. And you know, that is a, uh, uh, a, was a very uh, bold and trusting thing for them to do because they didn't, you know, my dad's first question was, what's the internet? Okay, so this, he wasn't making a bet on this company or this concept. He was making a bet on his son, as was my mother. So, uh, and, and I told them that I thought there was a 70% chance that they would lose their whole investment, which was a few hundred thousand dollars. And, um, and they did it anyway. And, uh, and, 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 you know, and I, I thought I was giving myself triple the normal odds because, you know, there's really, you know, if you look at the odds of a startup company succeeding at all, it's only about 10%. Here I was giving myself a 30% chance. <laughs> startup companies need early planetary alignment because there are so many things that can go wrong. And when we launched that store in July of 1995, we were shocked at the customer response. Uh, you know, literally in the first 30 days, we had orders from all 50 states and 45 different countries. Uh, and we were woefully unprepared from an operational point of view to handle that kind of volume. And uh, in fact, 
the, 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 we, this, we quickly expanded, we talked to our landlord and we expanded into a 2,000 square foot uh, basement warehouse space that had six foot ceilings. One of our 10 employees was 6'2". Um, he went around like this the whole time. And, and, um, uh, and we, were, we, were, we were doing our day jobs, which might have been you know, computer programming and uh, all the different things that 10 people will do in a little tiny startup company. And then we would spend all afternoon and into the wee hours of the morning packing up the orders and shipping them out. Uh, there, you know, I would drive these things to UPS and so we'd get the last one and we'd wait to the last second. I'd get to UPS and I'd sort of bang on the glass door that was closed and they always would take pity on me um, and sort of open up and let us you know, ship things late. Uh, we had so many orders that we weren't ready for that we had, a, 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 we had no real organization in our distribution centers at all. In fact, we didn't um, we were packing on our hands and knees on a hard concrete floor. And the, uh, the, the, I remember, just to show you how stupid I can be, I was, you know, it, it, my only defense is that it was late. But I, we were packing these things, everybody, everybody in the company. And, the, uh, and I had this brainstorm. And as I said to the person next to me, this packing is killing me. You know, my back hurts. This is killing my knees on this, this hard cement floor. And the person said, yeah, I know what you mean. And I said, you know what we need? This is my brilliant insight. We need knee pads. <laughs> I was very serious. And, and um, this person looked at me like I was the stupidest person they'd ever seen. They're like, I'm working for this person. This is great. <laughs> and um, said, what we need is packing tables. And I, I looked at this, <laughs> I looked at this person, and I thought that was the smartest idea I'd ever heard. The, the next day, we got packing tables, and I think we doubled our productivity. Um, that early stage, by the way, of Amazon.com, where we were so unprepared, is probably one of the luckiest things that ever happened to us because it formed a culture of customer service in every department of the company, every single person in the company because we had to work with our hands so close to the customers, making sure those orders went out, uh, really set up a culture that served us well. And that is our goal to be Earth's most customer-centric company. And then uh, a second round of fundraising about a year later or so, we raised a million dollars uh, and I had to talk to about 60 different People. This is angel investors, so venture capitalists who are totally uninterested. And this was a, a, this was a time, it wasn't like what people think of today. And, you know, in 1998 and 1999, you could raise $60 million for an internet idea uh, without a business plan with a single phone call. You know, it was a very different era. But back in 1995, uh, it was very difficult to raise money. Uh, it, and by the way, it wasn't more difficult than it had been for the previous 20 years to raise money. It just was sort of normally hard. It's supposed to be hard to raise a million dollars. And uh, we, uh, and you know, so with a lot of hard work, we raised that million dollars from about 20 different angel investors who invested about $50,000 each. And uh, that was the original money that really funded Amazon.com. Once you are looking at the odds in a realistic way, it's very important for entrepreneurs to be realistic. And so if you believe on that first day while you're writing the business plan that there's a 70% chance that the whole thing will fail, and, you know, uh, then that kind of relieves the pressure of, of self-doubt. I mean, it's sort of like, I don't have any doubt about whether we're going to fail. That's the likely outcome. <laughs> um, and, and it just is. And to pretend that it's not will lead you to do strange and you know, uh, uh, unnatural things. So we, uh, uh, you know, in what you do with those early investment dollars, you know, so if you have $300,000 and then you have a million dollars, what you do with those early precious capital resources is you go about systematically trying to eliminate risk. So you pick whatever the, you know, you think the biggest problems are and you try to eliminate them one at a time. 
And that's, uh, that's how small companies get a little bit bigger and then a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger until finally, at a certain stage, you reach a transition where you have, where the company has more control over its future destiny. You know, and when a company is very tiny, it needs a tremendous amount of not only hard work, but as we talked about earlier, luck. Um, as a company gets bigger, um, it starts to become a little more stable, where if the, you know, at a certain point in time, the company has a much bigger influence over its future outcome. It needs a lot less luck, and, and instead it needs the hard work. And at that point, in a way, at that point, there's a little bit more pressure, because then if you fail, you have nobody to blame but yourself. I had what I, I consider to be an idyllic childhood. I mean, I had uh, two parents who loved me incredibly. I also had a tremendous amount of contact with my grandparents, my mom's parents. In fact, I spent all my summers on my grandfather's ranch, uh, uh, not far from where we're sitting right now, not far from San Antonio, and uh, spent three months every year from the age of four to age of 16 working on the ranch with my grandfather, which was just an incredible, incredible experience. You know, ranchers uh, and anybody, I think, who works in rural areas, they learn how to be very self-reliant. And uh, whether they're farmers, whatever it is they're doing, they have to rely on themselves for a lot, of a lot of things. My grandfather did sort of all of his own veterinary care on the cattle. Um, we would you know, repair uh, the, the D6 Caterpillar bulldozer when it broke and it had gears this big, you know. <laughs> we would build cranes to lift the gears out. So, and this is just a very common sort of thing that, that folks in, 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 in faraway places do. Uh, and I think it's, it was a great experience. I remember the very first occupation I wanted to be when I think I was about six years old is archaeologist. And, uh, and this was even, I would like to point out, it's a point of pride pre-Indiana Jones. <laughs> um, and then I wanted to be an astronaut. Uh, and then later, by the time I was in my high school years, I wanted to be a physicist. And then um, by the time I got to college, I wanted to be a computer programmer. And that's actually what I you know, studied in school. And, and uh, that, and that's kind of you know what's led me along the path I'm on. I had some family role models, and I had some other people, um, you know, some sort of historical role models that I really looked at too. So certainly my my uh, uh, grandfather was a serious role model for me. I just had spent so much time. I think you learn different things from grandparents than you learn from parents. It's a it's a great. I would encourage anybody to try to spend time not only with their parents but with their grandparents. Um, and uh, but I and I also had. Uh, uh, I, two people I always would read about and, uh, uh, were Thomas Edison and Walt Disney. Those were sort of my two you know, biographical heroes. <laughs> I've always been interested in, in inventors and invention. And Edison, of course, just you know, for, for uh, a, a little kid is the, and probably for adults too, I still feel this way at least, is the, not only the symbol of that, but the actual fact of that, the just incredible inventor. Um, and, uh, and I've always felt that there's a certain kind of uh, important pioneering that goes on from an inventor like Thomas Edison. And then Disney was a different sort of thing. He also, you know, a real pioneer and an inventor and doing new things. But it seemed to me that he had this incredible capability to uh, create a vision that he could get a large number of people to share. Because the, the things that Disney invented, like Disneyland, you know, the, the theme parks and so on, they were such big visions that no single individual, unlike a lot of the things that Edison worked on, no single individual could ever pull them off. Um, and, uh, and Walt Disney really was able to get a big team of people working in a concerted direction. I was a very nerdy and good student, so I was, uh, I was uh, um, in the goody-goody uh, class of students and was always, you know, very working hard, studying, uh, you know, always did my homework on time. <laughs> <laughs> I was a good student. I liked school. And the things I got into trouble on were, like, I lost my library privileges one time, which was really, um, you know, inconvenient for me because I was, I was actually 
for laughing. I know you'll never believe this, but laughing too loudly <laughs> in the library. I've had this laugh all my life. I have no idea where it came from. There was a period where my brother and sister uh, wouldn't go see a movie with me. It was too embarrassing. <laughs> but uh, no, I was, uh, I was sort of, you know, probably unnaturally on the side of not getting in trouble. I mean, I, I, you know, I, we, by the time I was in high school, um, we did some, you know, some pranks type things, but they were the kind of pranks that at the end of the day, the teachers actually secretly loved, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember in uh, fourth grade, we had this uh, wonderful contest, which uh, was, you know, the people in the class, whoever, there was some prize, I can't remember what it was, whoever could re read the most Newbery Award winners in a year. Um, and I read through, I didn't end up winning, you know, I think I read like 30 Newbery Award winners that year, but somebody else read more. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and the, you know, the standout there is the old classic that I think so many people have read and enjoyed, A Wrinkle in Time. And I just remember loving, uh, loving that book. Um, uh, you know, later, I was always a big fan of science fiction, even from when I was, you know, in, in elementary school, reading various things, and uh, loved, of course, The Hobbit and, and, the, and Tolkien's trilogy that follows on from that. And this little town uh, where my uh, grandfather lived uh, in the summers, where I spent my time in the summer, uh, had a, you know, tiny little, you know, Andrew Carnegie-style library that where all the books had been donated from the local citizens. And uh, uh, I found, I mean, this is a very small library, smaller than the room that we're sitting in now. And it had, uh, uh, but it had an extensive science fiction collection because it just so happened one of the residents of this 3,000 person town had been a science fiction fan and donated their whole collection. And that started a love affair for me with, you know, people like Heinlein and Asimov and, you know, all the, 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 the well-known science fiction authors that, you know, persist to this day. My uh, math teacher in either fourth or fifth grade, I can't remember, Mrs. McInerney, um, she had a big influence on me. Uh, my calculus teacher in high school, Mr. Moore, uh, he had a big influence on me. Um, Mrs. Delchamps, who taught chemistry in high school. Uh, Mrs. Rule, who taught physics. Um, I really, uh, I, I, I have been blessed with um, you know, conscientious, hardworking, super smart teachers. And I don't know, because you know, I only got to go through school once, so I don't know if, I have a feeling I was lucky. <laughs> I know there are a lot of hardworking teachers out there, but I seem to have had more than my fair share. I always uh, wanted to please. You know, it was one of the things, and I think one of the things that these teachers who are really, really good do is they recognize that the, their students, they sort of, they, get, they, they create that environment where you can be very satisfied by, what's, by the process of learning that's going on. So it's, just, it's like anything, if you do something and you find it to be a very satisfying experience, then you want to do more of it. And so the great teachers somehow convey in their very attitude and their words and their actions and everything they do that this is an important thing you're learning. And, and by doing that, you end up wanting to do more of it and more of it and more of it. And I, you know, I think that's a, a real talent uh, that some people have to kind of convey the importance of that and to reflect it. A lot of entrepreneurs, there are a lot of people who are very smart, very hardworking, very few ever have you know, the planetary alignment <laughs> <laughs> that leads to a tiny little company growing into something substantial. Um, so that requires not only a lot of planning, a lot of hard work, a big team of people who are all dedicated, but it also requires that not only the planets align, but that you, know, you get a few gal what kind of business plan might make sense in the context of that growth. I think there are a couple of things, um, and one of the things that everybody should realize, and that is probably the single most important factor, is that any startup company that turns into a substantial company over the years never lose track of the fact that there was a lot of luck involved in that. So 
you know, there are galaxies and they're aligning too. And uh, that's certainly what happened to us. You know, our timing was good. Our, uh, our choice of product categories, uh, books, was a very good choice. And we did a lot of analysis on that to, uh, to pick that category as the first best category uh, for e-commerce online. But there were no guarantees that that was a good category. Um, at the time we launched this business, it wasn't even crystal clear that the technology would improve fast enough that ordinary uh, people, you know, non-computer people, would even want to bother with this technology. So that was good luck. Um, so there are a whole bunch of things that have to sort of add, align to make it work. I um, went to my boss and said to him, you know, I'm going to go do this crazy thing and I'm going to start this, uh, this The wake-up call was finding this startling statistic that web usage in the spring of 1994 was growing at 2,300% a year. You know, things just don't grow that fast. It's highly unusual. And uh, that set me about thinking, what, you know, what...